But due to gaps in my segregated secondary schooling, Bill Goldsmith, director of the program and professor at Brandeis, suggested with some protest on my part that I needed a transition year to repair some of the gaps. He then made contact with a headmaster at the time, and you know him very well, Charles Merrill. And I entered Commonwealth as a 12th grader in the fall of 1965. I must say coming from Mississippi, Boston felt to me like a foreign country. Uh, coming from a rural setting to an urban setting, uh, the mores were just uh, alien to me. Uh, as a Southerner, you know, one of the things that we would always do is that you would speak to people oftentimes strangers and of course I you know I took the subway and I took buses or I walked but I had the habit of speaking to people and oftentimes I didn't get a very good response so I had to cut that out and sometimes when I came back home to visit with my parents and I walked around my community and I did speak and people would look at me like I had been somehow uh, had lost my mind. Uh, I completed the year with a firm recommendation from uh, Mr. Merrill, and I entered Brandeis in the fall of 1966. Now I want you to fast forward for three decades um, from there, and you can see my resume about what I did uh, during those interim years. Bill has already mentioned that I had uh, gotten uh, some degrees from Brandeis during that interim, traveled to Africa, and began to travel all over the world during that period. And that was in 1985, there was, a free, there was a reunion. And at this reunion, I listened to uh, veterans like Bob Moses and others trade war stories about what it was like to have been actively involved in the civil rights movement, but to have been actively involved in the Freedom Summer, which took place in 1964. And that was a case called COFO, where they put together these various civil rights organizations. And then they invited students from all over the country to come down and help the people to register to vote. But one of the things they pointed out was that they didn't necessarily have people coming in because they needed them to help organize. Uh, they needed uh, outside folk, particularly Northerners, to come in and give some protection. Because I think the strategy was, and I remember hearing some of those discussions, was that if they invited these students in, white students mainly from the North, that if they attacked and did the things that they were routinely doing to black folk, it would force the media to come in and, 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 and put these pictures on TV so the whole nation could see what was going on. And I think to some extent, as I look back on that, I think the strategy worked. But anyway, back to this reunion, I heard them trading these war stories and one of the questions that I asked them then was, and I had been a veteran myself, but a younger veteran, well, you sit around, you talk, and you trade these war stories, and you have these things in common among yourselves, but what about the young people? What do they know about what you did? Uh, so I felt that, and it was true also in the kids in Benton County that we talked to earlier. They didn't have a clue about the fact that their ancestors had participated in one of the major transformational periods in American history, uh, the modern civil rights movement. I don't think, except for the founding of the country, the civil, the civil war that took place, the next biggest event for me, I believe, in terms of this country and the Democratic Republic is the civil rights movement. And young people, black and white, didn't know anything about it. It wasn't their fault because oftentimes these people kept these things to themselves. It reminded me of my, of my grandparents and my parents that had gone to World War I, World War II, that oftentimes you, they wouldn't talk about it. It was too painful, I think, a lot of times. And they talked among themselves, but they didn't share these stories with people that needed to know. I'll give another example that uh, Charlie Cobbs, who was a civil rights veteran and also a friend of mine, she's, taught at Brown for a number of years, and was a person who was the mastermind behind the uh, Freedom School concept. Uh, 
gives an example of going back to Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I want to say around the same time that um, the reunion was taking place, and was sitting on the foot uh, on the on the on the uh, steps of a, of a house, talking to young people from a middle school that was close to the place where Mega Evers lived and had been assassinated. And he asked them, "Have you heard of Mega Evers?" And they said, "No." And they talked a while, and then finally one kid said, "He got killed, didn't he?" And then in another conversation, he asked them, "Have you heard of Fannie Lou Hamer?" And they said, "No." So it's done on him that, with respect to this civil rights history, right there in Jackson, Mississippi, where a man gave his life. And Fannie Lou Hamer, who founded the Mississippi Democratic Party, Freedom Democratic Party, and did a lot of work in the Mississippi Delta, had been a, a, a sharecropper, uh, was not given an opportunity to get a formal education, but yet was, was a phenomenal organizer and went on to uh, do great work, uh, not only just in terms of the black community, but for the women movement. Uh, so I understand that some of you uh, have had an opportunity, to, the students, to have re read the book, or at least some section of the book, the historical context, and perhaps uh, some of the stories, some of these compelling stories that we were able to gather from these wonderful local people. Uh, so I will just summarize a few things about the book, and then we can talk uh, I, I at least give you space for some Q&A because I really would like to engage in some dialogue with you about not only historical times, but perhaps uh, you've got some things on your mind now uh, that you want to discuss. Um, just recently, the event even in Louisville, which just happened yesterday, may be something that you may want to discuss. Uh, you will notice that, that uh, I and my co-editors have divided uh, the voices into seven themes, uh, beginnings, generations, siblings, white reactions, observers, service, past and future, where we sort of focus on young people a little bit. We wanted to capture these uh, compelling stories uh, as soon as possible because we knew uh, these people, many of the older people would, would not be with us very long. A lot of the people we interviewed were uh, 100 years plus. Uh, so we knew they would not be with us and we wanted to get their stories before they passed on. And we are happy we were able to do that. So why voices? Uh, why voices? Uh, why did we select a very small county in Northern Mississippi? Why? Many books, not all good, have been written about the definitive civil rights movement. Selma, there's even a movie about Selma. Montgomery, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama. Atlanta, Georgia. Memphis, Tennessee. St. Augustine, Florida. Southwest Georgia. Greensboro. Mississippi Delta. Chicago. You name it. However, not much uh, love and research have been given to the rich civil rights experience in the hills of northern Mississippi. So we believe these extraordinary local people, not the professionals, of Benton County had a great deal to contribute to this democratic republic called America. Voices has a, a, a focus on the local, but we believe it has a universal message. And Amy Merrill, who's a friend of mine and trustee, I believe, there at Trauma Commonwealth, uh, shared this idea with me a few weeks ago. Some thoughts. The power of community working together. I think that comes through in the book. The indomitable human spirit, it looks like no matter what you do to people, even over a long period of time, they muster the spirit, they muster the will to carry on. 
notwithstanding the odds. What about the qualities of the people we interviewed? Uh, what comes to mind? Leadership jumps out at you. We, de we dedicated the book to Henry Reeves, who was one of the uh, key players in, in Benton County, had been born about 1900, had been homeschooled by his mother. Uh, they were landowners though, and we found that oftentimes landowners and blacks that had managed during reconstruction or even before, like some of my ancestors had, managed to get land and we felt that, that these people showed a kind of independence that the sharecroppers did not have. So leadership comes across. The power of fighting for the right to vote, uh, Miss Sarah Robinson, when you read her story there, you'll see here's a woman who worked for 50 cents a day, uh, but she felt the need to, to register. And I think we asked her the question, why, why do you sacrifice so much to get the right to vote? And she says, you know, I can't really feel like I'm a citizen. I can't feel like I'm an American citizen unless I have this right to vote. And I'm gonna do whatever is necessary to get that right. So this notion of sacrifice, desire for education for their children. And many of these people had not had an opportunity to finish high school, but they wanted their children to finish high school and they wanted their children to go on to college. And they were willing to put their children in harm's way to send them in the late mid sixties and early seventies to, to integrate the school or to desegregate the schools. Courage comes across, determination, discipline, survival, intelligence, insight, hard work. I mentioned that people work for 50 cents a day and later pick cotton or cut the weeds around cotton for $2 a day. Strength, optimism, love for America. At no point did you get this impression notwithstanding all the stuff that had happened to them, that they did not love America when America did not love them. I think we had a coach recently make that statement. Collective action, nonviolence, or there were some instances when people were willing to protect themselves, and you saw examples of that. But for the most case, people bought into the philosophy of nonviolence because they thought that was the best way to go. Forgiveness, forgiveness, very difficult, very difficult to forgive people that mistreat you. It's very difficult to forgive people who abuse you. And yet these people, many of them found a way to forgive. Wisdom, where did they get it from? This, this wisdom to just know that over the rainbow, over the hill, that, that it's gonna be a better day. The beloved community, something that Dr. King talked about, but I think comes across with these people, with these local people, with these extraordinary local people. But there were also some environments, some barriers that these people, notwithstanding all of these great qualities, had to face. Sharecropping, cheap labor, all in this environment of, of, of abuse and violence and lynching, microaggression. Sometimes it wasn't the big stuff that got on. If kids give examples of getting on the bus and having to go to the back of the bus or getting on the bus and another kid says, you know, this city is taken. Or the bus driver taking off before a kid can sit down. I mean, these are the microaggressions, not the big stuff, but this little nagging stuff that would impact a child or one of the Young lady is given an example of being a, a champion spelling person, be champion, and was in a situation where she was almost at the final and she misspelled the word. And in a similar like we have in the day, and kids just rose to their feet and applauded when she missed that word. And she said, as a young person, she had never seen such hate in her life. Just imagine how this impacts a person for life, a young person for life. There was always the fear. There was state sanctioned spy agency 
One was called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission that had been put together by, by, by the governor and the legislators. This commission had, its primary mission was to spy on people, to spy on citizens. When the civil rights workers came down, they would get your license plate tags as you left Tennessee and entered Mississippi. Uh, that's one of the ways that those civil rights workers in the Neshoba County, Mississippi were killed because the spy agency was able to get their license plate number and pass it on to the police department and the sheriff's department who were all interconnected with the Klan. And they caught them and lynched them and left them in an earthen dam in 1965. Tragedy, an example of a lady giving an example of how her daughters had been killed in accidents by white Europeans and nothing happened. She didn't have the resources to get a lawyer or having three kids, one, two dying of cancer and another one dying of kidney failure and yet going on to say, look, as a woman, they were told she could not buy land and she said, I'm gonna buy land. I'm gonna have a place of my own, which she eventually was able to achieve. Institutional racism, intimidation, and of course, paternalism. Finally, you will find the local people we interviewed and wrote about are not one dimensional. Uh, we, and that's why we have the observers and we have the white reactors. Uh, we have examples of European Americans and showing acts of kindness. Uh, a woman in a segregated doctor's office in Holly Springs allowed an African American woman to go in her place, although the African American woman was there in the first place anyway. But the point was in those days with the Jim Crow laws, and black white sign, black white water fountains, uh, when white patients came, they went first. And even if blacks were there first, they still had to get the back of the line before they could be waited on. In this case, this woman was in incredible pain. And this other woman had the compassion to see that and say, doctor, let her go first, please. An act of kindness. A man teaching Reverend Bear to read for the first time, a European American. And as you know from history, particularly the before the Civil War, throughout this country, just not in the South, it was a crime to teach Black people to read. And in the South, if you taught them to read, that would meant sometime the death penalty. A teacher, European teacher, who believes in students, notwithstanding apartheid and class privilege. So she insisted that her kids do the best they could, be all that they could, and not allow these barriers to, to stop them. A Miss Rennick, I think her name was. So many African-Americans did not participate in the movement struggle. And people always make the assumption that all black folk did, they didn't. There were black folk, there were African-Americans who did not engage in this movement, engage in this struggle for human rights, either because of fear lack of interest, or in some cases, an attempt to please the power structure, the higher caste, if you, if you will. Because one of the things about this book, Caste, which I think in many ways relates to some of the examples we give in, in Voices, you have this three-tier system. You have the European-American, now it's white at the top. You have Asians, Latino to some extent, in the middle. And you have African-Americans traditionally commodity and slave property at the bottom. And so with that kind of structure in place for essentially 400 years, it's not unusual for people to be unwilling to challenge that caste system. Because like in South Africa, you, uh, and as we felt perhaps in the South when I was growing up, folks that would tell you it's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. Therefore, how can you change it? John Lewis talks about that, getting in good trouble. And sometimes you have to get into good trouble to bring about the change. And some of these people stepped out and said, 
notwithstanding apartheid, notwithstanding segregation, notwithstanding this history. We think there's a better way. We think American democracy says that all people are equal. And if it says it in document, even though it's not in practice, we're going to force your hand. At least we're going we're to gonna, we're gonna reveal that contradiction. So other than their messages and lessons, I have two quotes which I believe apply to these people. I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. And that quote is from Dr. Martin Luther King, of course. I believe that too many people wait until the pain of remaining the same is greater than the pain of change. I believe that too many people will wait until the pain of remaining the same is greater than the pain of change. Uh, Nettie Witter. I believe these statements easily apply to the people of North Mississippi Hill Country who struggled for more than a century. And I think uh, these examples pertain to the whole world. I think the whole world uh, ha has benefited, continue to benefit from the lessons learned from the struggles of the civil rights movements of the 1960s. I had the fortune to travel in the Middle East, uh, particularly uh, Egypt, but Israel and Palestine. And this was during the Arab Spring. And I spent time talking to people there about the movement before it was crushed by dictatorship in Egypt. Why, why were they taking the chance to go up against a system that was seeing it was impossible? And what many of these people told me that they had learned their lessons from the civil rights movement that had taken place way back in the 1960s. So those examples were still there. And I think we still have them now that this, this fight to bring about a more beloved community and a democratic republic that's real for all these people. Um, still compelling. So given Black Lives Matter and other contemporary movements, there may be lessons which can inform your movements in 2020 and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you very much. What I think we'll do, we have about uh, almost 15 minutes for question and answer. So if you have a question for Mr. DeBerry, uh, if you could raise your hand in the participants window and I will call on you. And I'm first going to uh, stop the spotlight we'll, so we can see who's uh, asking the question as well. Ms. Brewster, you, be a, you have a question? Yes. I'm, you said a little bit about how you ended up at Commonwealth. And I'm curious about the way that was presented to you. You mentioned some resistance. And you also used the word gap to describe um, what, as you implied, needed filling in your education. And I wondered how much it mattered to you, the way that was expressed. It's a way I remember um, talking about kids who came in from less privileged schools that we are wondering if we should move away from. Um, I just wanted to know to you, how much did it matter? Good question. When I left the South, i.e. Mississippi to go to Boston, I went to the Cunningham program, which I mentioned earlier. And of course, I was there with other uh, students who were from working class backgrounds, uh, both uh, African Americans and European Americans and Latino Americans. And it was a difficult summer for all of us. Um, Bill Goldsmith and I had a lot of respect for each other. Um, he, he was a good man, and I think he respected me um, as a person as well as a student. 
So we spent time talking. We would drive around, go to breakfast, go to lunch. And, you know, he said, look, Roy, uh, you have the ability. Um, you have the drive. You have the intelligence. You had no control over that apartheid system that did not provide the books. You had no control of that system that did not provide the skilled teachers. You had no control over those people that did not, that did not allow your parents an opportunity to, to go on to high school or to go to college to create that kind of environment where you could have been at a level where when you came in here, you could compete academically. And I protested. I said, look, I still think I can do it. I had done fairly well in some subjects and not so well in others. And, but after the discussion, after protesting, I was able to see that he had a point and that if I wanted to move on and really in a Brandeis in the fall and be able to compete at a comfort level, um, I eventually agreed with him. And I think coming to Commonwealth and getting the support at Commonwealth, because I did get support, uh, starting with uh, Charles Merrill, but it was still a difficult year because being in Boston was new for me, living uh, on, on my own for the first time at 16, I think I had just turned 17, uh, not having any family in Boston, not knowing anybody in Boston. Uh, it was a difficult year. And most of the students uh, we, I made friend, friends with, but there were some that were, you know, from the upper crust, I call it, you know, from the upper class and had experiences that were foreign to me, alien to me. So even if you were kind, even if you were nice, there, there were nothing we had in common. Um, so it was a difficult year, but I was able, because of support from some of the teachers and staff and Merrill, um, I was able to get through. And I later learned after I entered Brandeis that fall, even though that first year was not easy, the Commonwealth experience made it much easier for me to navigate because the time I became a, a sophomore, I was on the Dean's list. So Commonwealth was a transition in retrospect that I needed, even though initially I didn't quite understand what was going on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lizzie Wakefield, do you have a question? Uh, what would you say is the biggest positive change you've experienced in your whole like, life and what is the biggest change you've seen and why do you think it happened when you when it did? Good question. I think the biggest change that I saw was to grow up in an apartheid or a segregated system and see within a period of 10 years that system pretty much broken. Uh, that is not to say all the economic things was achieved, but the kind of barriers that I saw when my parents could not register to vote. And I was able as an 18 year old, well, it was uh, 21 at that time, but as soon as I became 21, I registered to vote and I was able to get them to register to vote. That would have been unthinkable in my grandparents' uh, lifetime. And they were born in the 18, 90s and beginning of the 20th, 20th century. To see that change was remarkable. However, I do believe that it was because of the people who initially had been fearful and overcome, I think, by the power of the people before them that they didn't think it was possible. To see that transformation and to see local people engage themselves in a way to bring about that kind of social change was phenomenal. So that was probably the biggest change. Of course, the other thing was the fact that I was able to come out of Mississippi, uh, end up at Commonwealth, end up at Brandeis, uh, get a PhD from Brandeis in political science and government. And my parents came up and witnessed that in 1978. That would have been unthinkable 10 years earlier uh, for my family to have even dreamed about. So that civil rights movement and seeing those kind of concrete changes made within a decade was probably the biggest change that I saw. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Haber. 
Hi, thanks. Um, I was hoping that you could say more to the students about what uh, Dr. King's idea of the beloved community was, what it meant to you, and how we might use it today. Yeah, I think Dr. King had that vision, but I think some of these people in this book also had that sense of the beloved community. Uh, you know, King was a religious man, and King was sort of a philosopher, and he was more than a dreamer, although I think people always tend to focus on the dream speech and not the feast that they gave about the war in Vietnam. Uh, he was also a very practical man. Uh, King, like I guess I do to some extent, I believe we have a democratic republic. And I think the ideals and the creeds are good. King, I think, felt, as I do to some extent, that we need to keep working hard at getting that, that document closer to reality. So I think King's vision would be that, and others who fought in the civil rights movement and some of the folks that are now engaged in social movement, somehow want that ideal document and the practical stuff to be more real. Uh, so if you say, we all equal, and then we look at housing, and we look at economics, we look at jobs, we look at the police, we look at a whole bunch of things, and young people see these contradictions. So we need to minimize the contradiction, it seems to me, continue to work towards, because the document itself, I think it's good. Although the founding fathers and mothers themselves, but they were fathers, not mothers, had all kinds of flaws, right? But for some, at some level, there were people who always, whether it was Sojourner Truth or Tutman, Douglas, said, let's keep pushing the envelope. Now, the, the issue though here is America is a young country and it's an experiment. So the question that I have sometime as I get older is how much longer do we have to make this experiment work before it goes in a different way? And I think we kind of like close to that point now um, in this country. And, you know, it can go either way. We can either sort of turn it back and sort of move towards this beloved community that King talked about, or we can go another way. Now, one of the things I say in our close, with this book that I mentioned, Cast, which is out, it, out there, uh, it talks about this notion of Germany and, you know, and India with the old caste system and how Notwithstanding all the good things we say about America, but America has some things that are not so good. Uh, the eugenic movement, for example, that gave Hitler many of his ideas for Nazism uh, and what to do with the Jews, they had already practiced on black folk in this country. So it's, there's that, always that tension between moving towards this beloved community or moving towards a very different kind of things like totalitarianism or fascism. And, you know, we kind of like get that drink and it's not a given, uh, you know, I, that's why I, I love to see young people now engaged because if you don't get engaged, if you don't vote, if you don't, uh, uh, of course, stay nonviolent, but you really do have to make it a struggle to make America be America. Because I've always asked the qu question, can America be America? And that jury is still out. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have time for, um... One more question, although, uh, yeah. So Mr. Singer, your question. So uh, the 1960s were uh, obviously an ex uh, explosive, uh, explosively a social time in America. And while that was going on, there was also the Vietnam War. And uh, as we see today with the police being militarized, especially in the past decade, I'm wondering how um, people in the civil rights movement thought about the relationship between uh, imperial wars abroad and the violence of, and state repression at home? Oh, I think there was a link, and I think he pointed that link out. And I think the one of the reasons was to kill, and that's my own view. But if you listen to his speech that he gave at Riverside Church in 1968, but it wasn't the first time King had started to talk about that war and that relationship between what America was doing to the American citizens, right? Because he saw what was happening in 68 before he was assassinated and what was going on in the war. And of course, he saw in Vietnam, where I went recently, and they don't refer to him as a Vietnam War, they refer to it as an American War. 
because they take it from a different perspective than we do. But King was able to see that connection. And I think there were other people in that civil rights movement were able to see the co contradiction and connection between the war, which you refer to as a kind of war that my judgment should not have been fought, and what was going on in, in, in our own country. And, and he addressed that. Roy, this has been extraordinary. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. This is, uh, this is terrific. And um, we had Eric Foner last year who spoke about the Reconstruction Amendments. These, these, these are topics that are very much alive today. And to be able to hear your firsthand account is really thank, thank you very much and tell the students to please read uh, those stories some as many they can because i think they'll find them much more compelling than me as editors we just try to record the story we're not the story <laughs>